Welcome to CSET Biology, the cover page. I am Mr. Wilson, and today we're looking at the May-June 2016 Biology Pass paper. We're going to be looking at question number one that deals with enzymes and, of course, a line graph. You want to stick with me as we move through this paper. Be reminded to like, share, and, of course, subscribe. When you subscribe, remember to hit that notification bell and select all so you'll be notified as soon as there is a new publication. Join us on Wednesdays, Fridays, and of course Sundays at 5.05 where we stream live classes from Kingston, Jamaica. Let's hop right into the question. Section A. Answer all questions in this section. Write your answer in the space provided in this booklet. Now, students investigate the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction. So this is pretty, mu pretty much the aim for this particular lab. Students are supposed to investigate the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction of enzymes. And a particular enzyme here is catalase. They use crushed potato as the source of enzyme. And they place actually 5 mg into each of 7 test tubes. Then they added 3 cm cube of 1% hydrogen peroxide to each test tube and placed them into water bath kept at the following temperature. 0 degrees Celsius, 10 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius, 30 degrees Celsius, and of course, 40 degrees Celsius. They also had two at 50 degrees Celsius and 60 degrees Celsius, respectively. They count the number of bubbles released per minute from each test tube and, of course, recorded the data in the table you are seeing below. Here you would have seen the aim of the lab and the procedure. Now we're going to be looking at the observation after which we're going to be doing the analysis with a graph. So this table is pretty uh, a wonderful table as it looks at uh, pretty much all the concept there should be in a table. A table should have four sides. The unit, as it were, degree Celsius is not supposed to repeat, be repeated in the table. And of course, we are having three columns here and eight rows. Interestingly, this might be a little worrisome for some persons owing to the fact that the first column should have had the independent variable. In this graph, it is the second column that has the independent variable, and we're working on a line graph. Let us look at some questions here. Now, we're supposed to plot the graph on a grid, and that grid is provided on page 5 to show the relationship between the number of oxygen bubbles release and, of course, temperature. Now, for your graph, we're supposed to determine the optimum temperature of the enzyme, and that's after reaction. Now, your optimum temperature is going to be that highest point where the enzymes are most useful, are most efficient. And this, of course, is going to be 40 degrees Celsius. And that would have been at a 15 bubbles high. That's where we found our optimum uh, temperature. And I'm going to be showing you that in the graph as soon as we would have constructed the graph. Just a bit, and I'll go through construction of the graph. Great. So you are supposed to construct a graph, and there are some tenets that you're supposed to look for, or that are looked for uh, in a graph. The first thing I want to show you, and I'll be up and down working with this graph, the graph must have a title. Here the title is given to you, so really you don't need to rewrite the title. All the axes must be labeled. So here we have the x-axis, x-axis here being temperature, and temperature has been measured in degrees Celsius. Usually we put the degrees Celsius here in brace. It's not in brace, but you can do that. And we're using an arrow to show the direction of increase. So it is suggesting that it, the temperature is increasing in this direction. Also, importantly, you should construct the graph, not just the curve. To construct the graph, you must draw the x and the y-axis, the x and the y-axis. For this graph, I am showing you just about everything. So you're seeing the x-axis there being drawn in red, 
and the y-axis being drawn in red as well. Now, if you observe on the y-axis, we have the name of the axis, and the name for both axes would have been taken from the table. So this is the number of oxygen bubbles, and number of oxygen bubbles is being measured in, of course, uh, it's pretty much measured per minute. Let us look at the table for number of oxygen bubbles, and this is, of course, per minute, and this serves as a y-axis, and here we have the x-axis from the table. This is going to be easy as we walk through this graph. Here, your graph must have a suitable scale. The scale must be pretty much a uh, scalar to both axes. You want to ensure that there's some consistency as you work the graph. So on the x-axis, we have one centimeter representing five degrees Celsius. So you're going to see that as we move to the x-axis, you are seeing that one centimeter represent five, two centimeter representing ten, and you can see the graduation going across the x-axis. On the y-axis, let us look at what we have there as a graduation on the scale. One centimeter representing one oxygen bubble. Look at that as we go down. So as we move from zero to one, zero to one, we're finding just one uh, bubble. Now, we have looked at the axis, naming the axis, working on the scale. Now we are going to look at constructing the curve. Now, any line on the graph, be it straight, curved, waved, it is considered to be a curve. Now, if you are drawing a graph and you are using a dot to plot your points, it is recommended that you put a small circle, as we have here in red, around that dotted uh, point. If that is not done, any dot on the grid could be considered to be a point that you intended to plot. However, when you have a circle around it, that would remove it. I have used my little skill of Microsoft Word to draw this curve. So it's not so uh, properly drawn, but pretty much it sells the concept nicely. So we move on up to the top of the curve here where we have optimum. This is pretty much an optimum temperature as this is where we are going to have the ice activity from the enzyme 15 bubbles here now if you observe we don't have a sh there's not a sharp increase and a decline there is a curve here in the graph to show that there, it's a process it took place over some time not up and down as if uh, a bomb fell there all right so we went down so the next thing we need to look at is to describe the shape of the graph now, there are many terms that we could use to describe shape of graph. We could talk about it uh, increasing significantly, decreasing significant. We could talk about marginal. We could talk about fluctuation. We could talk about gradual. We could talk about constant. All those are words that we use to describe graph. And when we're describing graph, we're pulling on our analytical skill. So we're going to move on down and see what else there is for us to answer re this graph. If you have further questions, please leave them in the comment below. We're expected to explain the shape of the graph at each of the following temperature range. The first temperature range being 0 to 10 degrees Celsius. Now, what we figured out here based on the graph is that there was a gentle increase in enzyme activity. And we can see that on the graph here, a gentle a gentle increase in the activity we are seeing from here to here, so from 0 to 10, we are thinking that this is a gentle increase. But look at how we continue to interpret it. A gentle increase in enzyme activity resulting in a gentle increase in the curve of a graph we showed an upward movement from 0 to 1 bubbles at 0 degrees Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius. This is pretty much a good example of answering this question. It might be able to be answered using other words, but you could, of course, share that with me in the comment below. Let us look at 11 to 40 degrees Celsius. There was a sharp increase in enzyme activity at 11 degrees Celsius moving up to 40 degrees Celsius. And, of course, at 40 degrees Celsius, you would have seen that we had the optimum temperature. This is reflected in the sharp increase in the number of bubbles from a little over 1 to 15 and the sharp upward movement of the curve. Let us look at the sharp upward movement that looks at 11 
to 40. So 11 to 40 would start somewhere here, the first blue line here, and it would move on up to optimum. So you're seeing this sharp increase here. First five minutes, we had just one or less than one bubble. And when we reached up to 10 minutes, there was one bubble. But for the second 10 minutes, if you observe here, it increased by four to actually five. Let's move on down to see what else is there for us to answer. Really interesting graph. Please be reminded that you can pause at any time. Let's look at what happened above 40 degrees Celsius. Enzyme activity having reached optimum took a sharp decline as temperature was no longer favorable for the reaction. This created a non-functional active site to the substrate. This is observed in the sharp decline in the curve to zero. So it declined sharply, significantly, from 40 down to zero degrees Celsius. We would have gone at six marks if we mastered that skill. Now, interestingly here, we're supposed to write a conclusion that the student could draw from this result. Now, we have to pay attention now to the aim of the experiment in order to write a good conclusion. Let us just up onto the top of this page to look at what the aim was. So our aim here is to look at the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction of enzyme. So we are looking at the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction for the enzyme. So we are not just looking at the effect of temperature on enzyme here, we are looking at the rate. So that is very important to look at. If we were looking at the effect of temperature to the uh, enzyme reaction, then easily we could have said uh, enzymes are denatured by high temperature. But that is not where, what we're looking at. We're looking here at the rate. So the best answer here is that enzymes work best at a particular temperature, and the particular temperature is going to be about 40 degrees Celsius. Now, we really don't need to name or say everything that happens at each of the graduation. A summative or a summary of what is happening in the graph is uh, ideal here. So enzymes work best at a particular temperature. That's going to be the most suitable answer for this question. I will move on down to V. So just one reason why living organisms need to maintain a constant internal temperature. Now you would have seen that has the temperature uh, elevated above 40, there was a sharp decline in activities. So to ensure that the body functions properly as enzyme work best at a narrow temperature, and if the temperature is off, it will, of course, affect the functioning of the enzyme. So if we want to ensure that all the reactions in the body, they are taken care of in a timely manner and properly, it is very important that a constant internal environment is, of course, maintained. Let us look at VI. This, this, it describes two precautions that the student should take when doing the experiment. So you, are, you want to look at precaution here. And what I think we need to do is to maintain a specified temperature or a specified temperature to ensure a accurate result. You would have observed that all seven test tubes were pretty much at different temperature. We want to ensure that that is maintained to ensure a accurate res result. We want to observe the experiment carefully to ensure an accurate count of the bubbles and you would have gotten two marks for that and we move on down how could this experiment be modified to investigate the effect of ph on enzyme now there's a lot of things that we would need to do we need to use a varying ph in each of the seven test tubes from acid to base we need to maintain of course room temperature so what we are going to observe here that all but the temperature from the previous experiment is maintained Use pH meter or pH paper to test the pH of each tube and count the number of bubbles from each tube. And you, having done this, you would have received a two mark for that question. We're supposed to name two enzymes that function in protein digestion and describe the role of each. 
now we could think readily about pepsin pepsin is of course found in the stomach it is a acidic environment and pepsin breaks down protein into peptones then another enzyme we could think about is trypsin which is of course secreted by the pancreas found in a small intestine so of course we are going to be finding this trypsin in the small intestine but it is actually secreted by the pancreas it were best in a basic or alkaline environment and it converts peptones mm -hmm. to polypeptides another enzyme we could think about is renin and of course renin is working in a acidic environment as it is found in the stomach now what i want you to do is to tell me in the chat what is the substrate for renin and we'll look at the other question before food can be chemically digested by enzyme it must first be mechanically broken down mm -hmm. in the alimentary canal name two parts of the alimentary canal name two parts of the alimentary canal that are responsible for the mechanical digestion of food well we could think about the mouth with the feet, teeth breaking down the food or we could think about the stomach with the churning of the stomach also assisting with breaking down the food some persons probably would say the uh, movement of peristalsis the crushing action of the muscle could also assist with breaking down the food next question give two reasons why mechanical digestion of food is important well it increases the surface area of food particles so that chemical digestion can take place effectively it also helps to move food through the alimentary canal in a small manageable portion of course you wouldn't just pick uh, a piece of chicken and just shove it in the mouth and swallow we're of course going to need it to be broken down into more manageable pieces so that peristalsis can be effective another question explain the significance of chemical digestion of food chemical digestion pretty much involves the use of enzymes so chemical digestion increases the availability of food nutrient to the body another thing we know is that it breaks down macronutrient into smaller usable form for the body so here we could look at protein being broken down into uh, peptones and polypeptides and finally amino acids so the body would have it to use so very very important there is of course chemical digestion that takes us to the end of this question question number one for the may june 2016 biology paper please be reminded to like share and of course subscribe and when you do hit that notification bell and select all so you'll be informed as soon as there is a new publication join us on a wednesday friday and sunday at 505 for live classes streaming from kingston jamaica thanks much for joining